the lonely tree. Anna was curious about the tree, so she decided to walk towards it. As she got closer, she noticed that the tree was bare and didn't have any leaves. She wondered why it was the only tree in the field and why it looked so sad. Anna was a young girl who loved spending time outdoors and exploring the natural world. She had a deep appreciation for nature and was always in search of new adventures. One day, as she was wandering through a field, she noticed a tree standing alone in the distance. The tree was tall and strong, but it looked lonely. Anna felt sad for the lonely tree and wanted to help it. She decided to visit the tree every day and give it a little bit of water and attention. She would talk to the tree, telling it about her day and her adventures. Over time, Anna noticed a change in the tree. It started to grow new leaves and become more vibrant. The tree was no longer lonely as it had Anna to keep it company. The two of them developed a special bond and Anna looked forward to visiting the tree every day. As the months passed, the tree grew stronger and more beautiful. Birds would come to rest on its branches and other animals would seek shade under its leaves. Anna was happy that she could make a difference in the life of the lonely tree. She learned that sometimes even the smallest acts of kindness can make a big impact. One day, as Anna was visiting the tree, she noticed a small sapling growing next to it. The tree had produced a seed and a new tree was beginning to grow. Anna was overjoyed to see that the lonely tree was no longer alone as it would now have a companion to grow alongside. From that day on, Anna continued to visit the tree and its new sapling every day. She watched as they grew and flourished, and she knew that her small act of kindness had made a big difference. The lonely tree was no longer lonely, and it had Anna to thank for it. One day, as Anna was sitting under the shade of the tree, she noticed a man walking towards her. The man was carrying a camera and he looked like he was on a mission to capture the beauty of the field. When he got closer to Anna, he stopped and looked at the tree. That's a beautiful tree. What kind of tree is it? It's a lonely tree. A lonely tree? What do you mean? It's a tree that used to stand alone in this field. It was bare and didn't have any leaves. But then I started visiting it, and giving it a little bit of water and attention every day. It started to grow new leaves, and birds and other animals started to come to it. Now it's not lonely anymore. That's a great story. Would you mind if I took a picture of you and the tree? Of course not. That would be amazing. The man took a picture of Anna and the tree, capturing the beauty of the moment. He told Anna that he was a photographer, and that he would like to feature her story in a magazine that he worked for. Anna was thrilled that her story would be shared with the world. She thanked the man for his interest and asked him how he became a photographer. I've always loved capturing moments that tell a story. I believe that photography has the power to inspire people, and your story about the lonely tree has certainly inspired me. Anna smiled and shared with the man how she had always loved spending time in nature and how she came to befriend the tree. It's truly remarkable what you have done for this tree. Your kindness and compassion have helped it to grow and thrive. Thank you. It's important to care for the natural world around us. We all have a part to play in making our communities more beautiful and connected. I completely agree. It's people like you who make a difference in the world. Your story will help to inspire others to take action and care for their local environments. I hope so. It would be wonderful to see more people planting trees and caring for the world around them. Absolutely. Your story is a reminder that even the smallest act of kindness can make a big difference.
I'll make sure to feature it in the magazine, and I hope that it will inspire many more people. That would be amazing. Thank you for taking the time to hear my story and for helping to share it with the world. The man and Anna continued to talk for a while longer, sharing their love for nature and the importance of caring for the environment. As they parted ways, they both felt a sense of joy and hope, knowing that they had made a small but meaningful connection through their shared passion for the natural world. Anna's story was a reminder that even the smallest act of kindness can make a big difference. It also reminded people of the importance of nature and the need to care for it. As time passed, the tree continued to thrive. The sapling had grown into a strong and healthy tree, and the two trees stood side by side, no longer lonely. Anna continued to visit the trees every day, and she knew that she had made a difference in their lives. In the end, Anna's act of kindness had a ripple effect. It had inspired others to care for the natural world, and it had helped to create a more beautiful and connected community. The Lost Key Sophie had just moved to a new neighborhood with her family. She felt lonely and out of place in her new surroundings. The houses looked different, the streets were unfamiliar, and she didn't have any friends yet. She missed her old home and her old friends, but she knew she had to make the best of the situation. One day, while exploring her new neighborhood, Sophie came across a small key lying on the sidewalk. She picked it up and examined it closely. It was an old-fashioned key with a long stem and a small, intricate head. Sophie wondered what it might unlock. She decided to keep the key in her pocket and see if she could find the lock it belonged to. As Sophie continued her exploration, she noticed a small park nearby. There were swings, a slide, and a few benches. Sophie saw a woman sitting on one of the benches, looking sad. Sophie decided to approach her. Hello, hello. Sophie said. Are you okay? The woman looked up, surprised to see a young girl talking to her. Oh, hi. She said. I'm Maria. I'm just a little down today. Sophie smiled. I'm Sophie. Do you want to talk about it? Maria looked at Sophie and saw the kindness in her eyes. She decided to open up. I lost something very important to me. She said. It's a locket that my grandmother gave me before she passed away. It has a picture of her inside. I've been searching for it for days, but I can't seem to find it anywhere. I'm afraid it's gone forever. Sophie sympathized with Maria's plight. She knew what it was like to lose something important. I'll help you find it. She said. Maybe we can look for it together. Maria smiled. That would be amazing. She said. Sophie took out the key from her pocket and showed it to Maria. Maybe this key can help us find your locket. She said. Maria looked at the key and saw that it was the same size and shape as the locket. You might be right. She said. Let's go and see if it fits any of the locks in my house. They walked to Maria's house, a small, cozy cottage at the edge of the park. Maria took out a key ring with several keys and tried them one by one on the locks of the house. None of them fit. Sophie took out the key she had found and handed it to Maria. Try this one. She said. Maria inserted the key into a small lock on the front door. To her amazement, it turned smoothly and the door opened. She rushed inside, followed by Sophie. They searched the house from top to bottom, looking for the locket. They checked under the couch, behind the curtains, and in the drawers. They even searched the attic and the basement. But the locket was nowhere to be found. 
As they were about to give up, Sophie noticed a small box on a shelf in the living room. It was covered in dust and cobwebs as if it hadn't been opened in a long time. Sophie opened the box and saw the locket inside. She took it out and handed it to Maria. Maria was overjoyed. She hugged Sophie and thanked her for helping her find the locket. She was amazed that the key Sophie had found had led them to the locket. She felt that it was a sign of good luck. Sophie was happy to have helped Maria. She realized that the key had not only unlocked a door, but as soon as they arrived at the park, the three friends went straight to the pond. They searched every corner of the pond and the surrounding area, but there was no sign of the key. They looked for hours, but it seemed like the key had disappeared into thin air. As the sun began to set, they decided to call it a day and try again in the morning. They walked home feeling defeated and disappointed. Once they got back to the house, they realized that they didn't have a spare key to the house. They were locked out. They didn't know what to do. They couldn't call their parents because they were out of town and they didn't have any relatives nearby. They were stranded outside their own home with no way to get in. After some brainstorming, they came up with a plan. They remembered that the window in the kitchen was sometimes left unlocked, and they decided to try to climb in through the window. It was a risky plan, but they didn't have any other options. The tallest of the three, Sarah, boosted the others up to the window. First, she lifted up Mark, who managed to get a grip on the windowsill and climb inside. Then Sarah lifted up Lily, who also managed to make it inside. Finally, Sarah climbed inside herself. Once they were inside, they realized that they had left the front door unlocked. They had gone through all that trouble for nothing. But they were glad to be back inside their home, and they were grateful to have such resourceful friends. The next day, they went back to the park to continue their search for the lost key. They searched every inch of the pond again, and this time they decided to expand their search to the surrounding woods. They looked under rocks and fallen branches, in the tall grass and among the trees. After hours of searching, they finally found the key. It had been dropped near a tree at the edge of the pond. They were overjoyed to have found it and they couldn't believe their luck. They rushed back to the house and unlocked the front door. They felt relieved and happy to be back inside their home. They realized that sometimes it takes a little bit of effort and creativity to solve a problem, but with good friends by your side anything is possible. From that day on they made sure to keep their key in a safe place and to always have a spare key just in case. They also knew that they could rely on each other no matter what. The lost key had brought them together and had shown them the importance of resourcefulness, teamwork, and perseverance. After a few minutes of searching, they found themselves in front of an old wooden door, which seemed to lead to a cellar. Max tried to turn the rusty door handle, but it wouldn't budge. That's when he noticed a small keyhole below the handle. Guys, I think I found the door to the cellar, but it's locked, Max said, pointing to the keyhole. Maybe the key is somewhere in the house, Maria suggested. The three of them searched every nook and cranny of the house, but they couldn't find the key. They even searched in the attic and the basement, but still no luck. Just when they were about to give up, Max noticed a small piece of paper under a sofa cushion. He picked it up and unfolded it to reveal a message written in bold letters. The key to the cellar is hidden in plain sight, but only those who have a keen eye will find it. What does that mean? Maria asked, perplexed. I'm not sure, but it sounds like a clue, Max replied. They searched the entire living room, but couldn't find anything out of the ordinary. Just as they were about to give up, Emma noticed a small crack on the wall near the fireplace. She pressed her hand against it, and the wall slid back to reveal a hidden compartment. Inside the compartment was a small key, which Max quickly grabbed. 
They rushed back to the cellar door, and Max inserted the key into the lock. With a click, the lock turned, and they pushed the door open. As they descended the stairs, they were hit by the musty smell of the damp cellar. It was dark, and they could barely see anything. Max pulled out his phone and turned on the flashlight. At the bottom of the stairs, they found themselves in a small room filled with cobwebs and dust. In the center of the room, there was a large chest. Max walked over to it and tried to open it, but it was locked. Looks like we need another key, Max said, disappointed. Just then, Maria noticed a small keyhole on the side of the chest. Hey, there's another keyhole here. Maybe it's the same key, she said. Max quickly inserted the key he found into the keyhole, and with a click, the chest unlocked. They slowly lifted the lid, half expecting to find something valuable inside. To their surprise, the chest was filled with old books and papers. They searched through them, hoping to find something of interest. That's when Emma stumbled upon an old letter addressed to someone named Josephine. The letter described the story of a lost key that was said to unlock a secret room filled with treasure. The letter also contained a map that showed the location of the room. Excited by the prospect of finding the treasure, they quickly made their way back upstairs and out of the house. They followed the map, which led them to a small hill outside the town. After some digging, they found a small metal box buried underground. Inside the box, there was a key made of pure gold and a note that read, Congratulations, you have found the lost key. Use it wisely. Although they didn't find any treasure, they were happy to have solved the mystery of the lost key. And who knows, maybe one day they'll stumble upon another mystery that will lead them to an even greater adventure. And here is the end of the story. The Mysterious Box When Emily arrived at her grandmother's house for a visit, she noticed the strange box sitting on the living room table. It was small and made of polished wood, with intricate carvings etched into the sides. Emily's grandmother noticed her curiosity and told her the box had been in the family for generations, but no one had ever been able to open it. Emily was determined to solve the mystery and spent the next few days trying to open the box. She tried everything she could think of, from pushing and pulling on the sides to pressing on the carvings, but nothing seemed to work. Finally, frustrated and ready to give up, she set the box down and left the room. A few minutes later, she heard a faint clicking sound coming from the box. She rushed back into the room to find it was now open. Inside, there was a single piece of paper with a cryptic message written on it. The message read, The key to the box is not in the box, but in the journey to find it. Follow the path and the key will reveal itself. Emily had no idea what the message meant, but she knew she had to find out. She packed a backpack with supplies and set out on a journey to solve the mystery. The first clue led her to a nearby hiking trail. As she walked, she searched for any signs or markings that might lead her to the next clue. After several hours, she came across a small cave hidden behind a waterfall. Inside, she found a second clue, which read, The key is closer than you think. Follow the stars and the way will become clear. Confused but determined, Emily continued on her journey. She walked for hours, until she reached a high point with a clear view of the stars. Looking up at the night sky, she noticed a constellation in the shape of a key. She realized that the constellation was pointing in a specific direction, and she set off once again. After many more hours of walking, Emily finally arrived at an old, abandoned house. The door was locked, but the key was hidden in a nearby tree. Inside the house, 
she found the final clue, which read, The key is not an object, but a realization. Look within yourself and you will find the answer. Emily thought about the message for a long time, but she couldn't figure out what it meant. She began to feel frustrated and defeated. But then she remembered what her grandmother had told her sometimes the journey is more important than the destination. With a renewed sense of purpose, Emily took a deep breath and looked inside herself. She realized that the key was her own determination and perseverance. She had solved the mystery, not by finding a physical key, but by going on a journey of self-discovery. When she returned home, she proudly presented her grandmother with the open box and the mysterious message. Her grandmother smiled and told her that she was proud of her, and that the box had been a test to see if she was ready for the journey ahead. Emily felt a sense of accomplishment and gratitude for the experience, and she knew that she was ready for whatever challenges lay ahead. As soon as the box was opened, the room was filled with a bright light, blinding everyone for a few seconds. When their eyes adjusted to the light, they found themselves in a strange place. It was a beautiful garden with blooming flowers of every color and fragrance. The sky was a deep shade of blue, and the sun was shining bright. The air was filled with the sweet scent of blooming flowers and the sound of chirping birds. Everyone looked around, astonished by what they saw. They had never seen such a beautiful place before. They had no idea where they were or how they got there. Suddenly, a voice spoke to them from behind, Welcome to the Garden of Wonders. I am the guardian of this place. You have been brought here because you are the chosen ones who have the power to bring back the balance of the world. The guardian was a tall and slender figure with a glowing aura around him. He wore a robe of green, and his eyes shone like diamonds. His voice was soft and soothing. We have been sent here for a reason, said Leela in amazement. Yes. You have been chosen to restore the balance of the world, replied the guardian. How are we supposed to do that? Asked Tom. By finding the missing elements of nature that have been stolen by the dark forces. The world is out of balance because the natural elements have been taken away from their rightful places. It is up to you to bring them back, explained the guardian. The group looked at each other, unsure of what to do. They had never faced such a daunting task before. You must be wondering where to begin, said the guardian. Let me guide you. You need to go to the land of the sun, where the first missing element is hidden. How do we get there? asked Max. You will find a way. You must have faith in yourselves and the powers that you possess, said the guardian with a smile. Suddenly, the group found themselves back in the room, with the box sitting in front of them. They looked at each other in amazement, trying to process what had just happened. We have a mission, said Tom. We must find the missing elements and bring back the balance of the world. The group nodded in agreement, knowing that it was up to them to make a difference in the world. From that day on, the group set out on a journey to find the missing elements of nature. They faced many challenges, but with their courage, determination, and faith, they were able to overcome every obstacle. They traveled to the land of the sun, the land of the moon, the land of the sea and many other places, and found the missing elements. With each element they found, the world began to regain its balance, and nature began to flourish again. In the end, the group returned to the Garden of Wonders, where they were met by the Guardian. 
He congratulated them on their success and thanked them for their bravery. Thanks to you, the world is once again in balance. The elements of nature have been returned to their rightful places, and the world is flourishing once again. You have fulfilled your mission, and for that, the world will always be grateful, said the Guardian. The group smiled, knowing that they had made a difference in the world. They were proud of what they had accomplished, and knew that their journey had only just begun. They left the Garden of Wonders, ready to face new challenges and make the world a better place. And that is the end of the story. The Secret Garden It was a beautiful summer day when Mary Lennox, a young girl of ten, walked down the street with her parents. The sun was shining and the birds were singing. Mary was happy to be outside, but her parents seemed distracted and worried. Suddenly, Mary's mother fell ill with cholera and passed away. Mary's father, who was also ill, passed away a few days later. Mary was left alone and sent to live with her uncle, Archibald Craven, in a large, gloomy manor on the Yorkshire Moors. When Mary arrived at the manor, she was greeted by Mrs. Medlock, the strict housekeeper, who showed her to her room. Mary quickly became bored with the dull, uneventful life at the manor and longed to explore the grounds outside. One day, Mary heard strange noises coming from behind a locked door in the corridor. She became curious and asked Mrs. Medlock about it, but Mrs. Medlock about it, but Mrs. Medlock dismissed her questions. Undeterred, Mary began to search for the key to the door. Finally, Mary found the key and entered the room. Inside, she found a large, overgrown garden that had been locked up and neglected for years. Mary was fascinated by the garden and began to clean it up. With the help of a young gardener named Dickon, the garden began to flourish. Despite Mary's initial reluctance, she eventually gained the courage to visit her uncle, Archibald Craven, in his study. She told him about the secret garden and how she'd been caring for it. Archibald was reluctant to leave his study but eventually agreed to see the garden for himself. When Archibald saw the secret garden, he was amazed by its beauty. He became more involved in the lives of Mary and his son Colin, who had been bedridden since birth. Together, they explored the garden and enjoyed spending time outdoors. Mary and Dickon eventually convinced Colin to come out of his room and see the secret garden. Colin was amazed by the garden, and spending time outdoors helped to improve his health. The three children spent time in the secret garden, enjoying the beauty and tranquility of the natural world around them. As they worked together to care for the garden, the children learned to love and care for each other, each other as well. The secret garden had brought them together and had given them a sense of purpose and joy. Mary and Colin's uncle, Archibald, also found solace and healing in the beauty of the garden. Over time, Mary, Colin and Dickon continued to care for the secret garden and explore the natural world around them. They discovered many new plants and animals and even found a hidden door that led to an old abandoned room in the manor. In this room, they found a portrait of Mary's mother, and Mary finally began to understand her mother's love for her. As the children continued to explore and care for the secret garden, they became stronger and more confident. Colin's health improved, and he was finally able to walk on his own. Mary also became less self-centered and more kind-hearted, learning to appreciate the beauty of the natural world around her. One day, as the children were exploring the garden, they discovered a small robin who had injured its wing. They took the bird in and nursed it back to health, and it became a beloved companion to them all. As the summer came to an end, Mary, Colin and Dickon knew that they would have to leave the secret garden behind and return to their respective lives. 
but they promised to always remember the garden and the happiness it had brought them. In the fall, Mary returned to school, but she was no longer the same selfish and unhappy child that she'd been before. She had learned to appreciate the beauty of nature and to care for others, and she made many new friends. Colin returned to his studies, but he no longer felt trapped and confined by his illness. He was filled with a new sense of hope and joy, and he worked hard to continue improving his health. Dickon continued to work as a gardener, and he shared his knowledge and love of nature with others. He also remained a loyal friend to Mary and Colin, always ready to help them whenever they needed him. As the years passed, Mary, Colin and Dickon grew up and went their separate ways, but they never forgot the secret garden and the magical summer they had spent together. The garden had changed their lives forever, and it had given them a sense of wonder and joy that they would always carry with them. From there, it's the end. Cinderella, a classic tale in English. Once upon a time, in a land far away, there lived a beautiful and kind-hearted girl named Cinderella. She lived with her cruel stepmother and two stepsisters who treated her like a servant. Cinderella was always the one to do all the chores and to clean the house while her stepsisters went out and enjoyed their day. Despite all of her hard work, Cinderella never lost her kind spirit. She would often talk to the birds and mice who were her only friends. They were always there to comfort her whenever she felt sad or lonely. One day, the king's son announced that he was looking for a bride and that he would host a grand ball to find one. Cinderella was thrilled to hear this news, and she dreamed of attending the ball and meeting the prince. But her stepmother and stepsisters forbade her from going saying that she was not worthy enough to attend the grand ball. Feeling sad and defeated, Cinderella sat alone in her room, but suddenly her fairy godmother appeared and granted her wish to go to the ball. She transformed Cinderella's tattered dress into a beautiful gown and gave her a pair of glass slippers to wear. She also gave her a warning to return before midnight or the spell would be broken. At the ball, Cinderella was the most beautiful girl in the room. She caught the attention of everyone, including the prince. They danced together all night, and Cinderella felt like she was in a dream. But as the clock struck midnight, Cinderella remembered her fairy godmother's warning and left the ball in a hurry, leaving behind her glass slipper. The prince searched the entire kingdom for the girl who wore the glass slipper. When he arrived at Cinderella's house, her stepsisters tried to fit into the slipper, but it was only Cinderella's foot that fit perfectly. The prince recognized her and was overjoyed to have found his true love. Cinderella and the prince were married in a grand ceremony, and they lived happily ever after. Cinderella's fairy godmother continued to watch over her and help her whenever she needed it. The story of Cinderella is a timeless tale of perseverance and hope. It teaches us to be kind, patient, and compassionate towards others, even when we are faced with difficult situations. It also reminds us that dreams can come true if we believe in ourselves and have faith that anything is possible. In conclusion, Cinderella's story has touched the hearts of millions of people around the world for generations. It is a reminder that no matter how difficult our lives may seem, we can always find a way to overcome our challenges and achieve our dream. It is a classic tale of love, hope, and the power of believing in oneself. The Lion and the Mouse, an Aesop's fable in English. Once upon a time, in a forest far away, there lived a mighty lion. The lion was proud and powerful, and he thought that he was the king of the forest. One day while the lion was taking a nap, a tiny mouse ran across his paw, waking him up. The lion was angry and roared, how dare you wake me up, you insignificant creature. I could crush you with one paw. The mouse trembled with fear, but he spoke up bravely, please forgive me, great lion. I didn't mean to wake you up, I promise I will make it up to you someday. The lion laughed and said, how could a small creature like you ever help me? But I am feeling generous today. So. I will let you go. The mouse ran away as fast as he could, 
relieved that he had escaped unharmed. A few days later, the lion was caught in a trap set by a group of hunters. He struggled to free himself, but the trap was too strong. He roared for help, but no one came. Just then, the mouse heard his cries for help and ran to the lion's aid. The mouse saw the lion trapped in the trap and said, Don't worry, great lion. I will help you. The mouse climbed up onto the trap and began gnawing at the ropes with his sharp teeth. Slowly but surely, he was able to free the lion from the trap. The lion was grateful and amazed at the mouse's bravery. He said, Thank you, little mouse. You are truly a friend in need. I was wrong to underestimate your small size and your kindness. From now on, I promise to treat you with the respect you deserve. The moral of this story is that even the smallest creature can be of great help in times of need. It also teaches us not to underestimate the power of kindness and compassion and to treat all creatures big and small with respect. The story of the lion and the mouse is a timeless tale that has been passed down from generation to generation. It is one of the most famous Aesop's fables, and it has inspired many people to be kind and compassionate towards others. It reminds us that no matter how powerful or strong we may be, we can always learn something from those who are weaker than us. In conclusion, the lion and the mouse story teaches us that we should never judge others based on their appearance or size, and that we should always be willing to help those in need. It is a story that has stood the test of time and continues to inspire people of all ages to be kind, compassionate, and understanding towards others. The Tale of the Three Brothers, an English story. Once upon a time, there were three brothers who were wizards. They were skilled in magic, and they decided to use their powers to outsmart death. The eldest brother asked for a powerful wand, capable of defeating anyone in a duel. The second brother asked for a stone that could bring the dead back to life. The youngest brother, however, asked for a cloak that would make him invisible and allow him to hide from death. The brothers went on their separate ways, each with their own magical item. The eldest brother, feeling invincible with his powerful wand, sought out and killed anyone who crossed him. He became arrogant and cruel, believing that he was unstoppable. The second brother used his stone to bring back his lost love from the dead. However, he soon realized that she was not truly alive and that her presence was causing him pain and suffering. The youngest brother used his cloak to hide from death and lived a long and peaceful life. When he was an old man, he took off the cloak and passed it on to his son before greeting death as an old friend. The morale of this story is that death is inevitable and we cannot escape it no matter how much power we possess. It also teaches us that true love cannot be brought back from the dead and that sometimes it is better to let go of those who have passed away and cherish their memories. The story of the three brothers is a popular English tale that has been adapted into various forms, including in the Harry Potter series. It is a timeless story that reminds us of the importance of humility, love, and acceptance. In conclusion, the tale of the three brothers teaches us that there are some things that we cannot control, no matter how much we wish to do so. It also reminds us that the pursuit of power can lead to our downfall, and that true happiness comes from cherishing what we have and accepting what we cannot change. The Collision by George Ade. Once in the dim, dead days beyond recall, there lived a blue-eyed gazook named Steve. We refer to the period preceding the uplift when the candidate wearing the largest collar was the people's choice for aldermen. A good citizen wishing to open a murder parlor needed a couple of black bottles, a barrel of sawdust, and a pull at the city hall. When he opened up, he threw the key into the river and arranged to have. The bodies taken out through the alley so as not to impede traffic in the main thoroughfares. Twelve months every year marked the open season for every game from pitch and toss to manslaughter. Anyone in search of diversion could roll Kelly Pool at 10 cents a cue in the morning, go to the track in the afternoon, take in a 20-round scrap in the evening, and then shoot at the wheel a few times before backing into the flax. 
the police were instructed to make sure that all pushcart peddlers were properly licensed, Steve roamed the wide open town and spread his bets both ways from the jack. When he cut the string and began to back his judgment, he knew no limit except the Milky Way. Any time he rolled them, you could hear considerable rumble. All the bookies, barkeeps, bruisers, and the boys sitting on the moonlight rattlers knew him by his first name and had him tagged as a producer and a hell of a nice fellow. Steve heard vague rumors that certain stiffs who hurried home before midnight and wore white mufflers were trying to put the town on the fritz and can all the live ones. But he did not dream that a mug who went around in galoshes and drank root beer could put anything across with the main swive over at the hall. Oh, the rude awakening. One day he was in a pool room working on the form sheet with about 150 other students and getting ready to back Sazerac off the boards in the third at Guttenberg when some blue wagons backed up and Steve told the desk sergeant a few minutes later that his name was Andrew Jackson. Next day, he had a wire from a trainer, but when he went to the old, familiar joint, the plainclothes men gave him the sign to beat it, and he turned away, throbbing with indignation. The downtown books were being raided, but the Angoras kept on, galloping at the track so he rode out on the train every day in order to preserve his rights as a freeborn American. One day, just as he was peeling from his roll in front of the Kentucky Club in order to grab Gertie Glue at 8 to 5, lightning struck the paddock and laid out the entire works. When the touts and the sheet writers and the sure thingers came to and began to ask questions, it was discovered that the Yap legislature had killed the racing game and ordered all the regulars to go to work. Steve went back to town in a dazed condition to hunt up the gang and find out what could be done to put out the fire. When he arrived at the hangout, there was a flag at half-mast. The roost had been nailed up for keeping open after 11 o'clock. A few evenings after that, he sauntered up to a large frame building to look at a couple of boys who had promised to make 135 ringside. A cannon was planted at the main chute, and the street was filled with department store employees disguised as soldiers. Nothing doing. The governor had called out the militia in order to prevent a blot being put upon the fair name of the Commonwealth. With the selling platers turned out to pasture, the brace box, and the pinch wheel lying in the basement at Central Station, the pugs going back to the foundry and all the street lamps being taken in at midnight, no wonder Steve was hard pushed to find innocent amusement. He started to hang around a broker's office, but it was no fun to bet on a turnip when you couldn't watch the shuffle. Besides, the game was cold and was being fiercely denounced by the press. For a time, he kept warm in a bowling alley. Drive a man into a corner and goad him to desperation, and he will go so far as to bowl, provided that he lives in a German neighborhood. One evening, he went down to see the Walhallas go against the Schwabens, but the place was dark. The authorities had interfered. It seemed that the manufacture of bowling balls involved the destruction of the hardwood forests, while the game itself overtaxed certain important muscles, ending with Alice, at the same time encouraging profanity and the use of five-cent cigars. Steve had one standby left to him. He could prop himself up on them. Bleachers with a bag of lubricated popcorn between his knees and hurl insulting remarks at Honest Wagner, Joe Tinker, and Ty Cobb. When he crawled up in the 50-cent seats, he found the same old bunch that used to answer roll call at the pool room, the sharky club, and the betting ring. The law had made them decent citizens, but it hadn't made them any easier to look at. Steve longed for the ponies and the good old prelims between the trial horses, with blood dripping from the ropes, but when he picked up the pink sporting page in the morning, All he could find was that the Sacred Heart Academy has wrested the basketball trophy away from the West Division High. School. Baseball is only mere sport to one who has wanged the wise ikes that mark up the odds. Steve went to it because there was nothing else on the cards. One day he found every entrance to the park guarded by a blue burly and the crowds being turned away. The health department had put in a knock on the game on the ground that the ball, after being handled by various players and passed from one to the other, carried with it dangerous microbe. The officials insisted that, after every play, the ball should be treated with an antiseptic or else that each player should have an individual ball and allow no one else to touch it. 
The Society for the Protection of the Young had put up a howl because the game diverted the attention of urchins from their work in the public schools and tended to encourage mendacity among office boys. The concatenated order of highbrows had represented to the proper authorities that, as a result of widespread interest in the demoralizing pastime, ordinary conversation on the tail end of a trolley car was becoming unintelligible to university graduates, and the reports in the daily press had passed beyond the ken of a mere student of the English language. The Medical Society certified that eight out of ten men had shattered their nervous systems, split their vocal cords, and developed moral astigmatism, all because of the paroxysms resulting from partisan fervor. Either build an asylum in every block or else liberate the present inmates of all the nut colleges. It was not fair to keep the quiet ones locked up while the raving bugs were admitted to the grandstand every afternoon. Under the circumstances, a purely paternal administration could do only one thing. It put baseball out of business. On the very next afternoon, the unquenchable demand for sport asserted itself. Steve went into the backyard with his eldest son and looked about. Cautiously, is the lookout stationed on the fence? He asked. He is. Is the garden gate securely locked? It is. Are the mallets properly muffled? They are. Then tell with the law, we'll have a game of croquet. Moral, if it is in the blood, the only remedy is the substitution of iced tea. The Collision by George Ade. Once in the dim, dead days beyond recall, there lived a blue-eyed gazook named Steve. We refer to the period preceding the uplift when the candidate wearing the largest collar was the people's choice for alderman. A good citizen wishing to open a murder parlor needed a couple of black bottles, a barrel of sawdust, and a pull at the city hall. When he opened up, he threw the key into the river and arranged to have the bodies taken out through the alley so as not to impede traffic in the main thoroughfares, Twelve months every year marked the open season for every game from pitch and toss to manslaughter. Anyone in search of diversion could roll Kelly Pool at 10 cents a cue in the morning, go to the track in the afternoon, take in a 20-round scrap in the evening, and then shoot at the wheel a few times before backing into the flack. The police were instructed to make sure that all pushcart peddlers were properly licensed Steve roamed the wide open town and spread his bets both ways from the jack. When he cut the string and began to back his judgment, he knew no limit except the Milky Way. Any time he rolled them, you could hear considerable rumble. All the bookies, barkeeps, bruisers, and the boys sitting on the moonlight rattlers knew him by his first name and had him tagged as a producer and a hell of a nice fellow. Steve heard vague rumors that certain stiffs who hurried home before midnight and wore white mufflers were trying to put the town on the fritz and can all the live ones, but he did not dream that a mug who went around in galoshes and drank root beer could put anything across with the main swive over at the hall. Oh, the rude awakening. One day he was in a pool room working on the form sheet with about 150 other students and getting ready to back Sazerac off the boards in the third at Guttenberg when some blue wagons backed up and Steve told the desk sergeant a few minutes later that his name was Andrew Jackson. Next day, he had a wire from a trainer, but when he went to the old, familiar joint, the plainclothes men gave him the sign to beat it, and he turned away, throbbing with indignation. The downtown books were being raided, but the Angoras kept on, galloping at the track so he rode out on the train every day in order to preserve his rights as a free-born American. One day, just as he was peeling from his roll in front of the Kentucky Club in order to grab Gertie Glue at 8 to 5, lightning struck the paddock and laid out the entire works. When the touts and the sheet writers and the sure thingers came to and began to ask questions, it was discovered that the Yap legislature had killed the racing game and ordered all the regulars to go to work. Steve went back to town in a dazed condition to hunt up the gang and find out what could be done to put out the fire. When he arrived at the hangout, there was a flag at half-mast. The roost had been nailed up for keeping open after 11 o'clock. A few evenings after that, he sauntered up to a large frame building to look at a couple of boys who had promised to make 135 ringside. A cannon was planted at the main chute, and the street was filled with department store employees disguised as soldiers. Nothing doing. 
The governor had called out the militia in order to prevent a blot being put upon the fair name of the Commonwealth. With the selling platers turned out to pasture, the brace box, and the pinch wheel lying in the basement at Central Station, the pugs going back to the foundry and all the street lamps being taken in at midnight, no wonder Steve was hard pushed to find innocent amusement. He started to hang around a broker's office, but it was no fun to bet on a turn up when you couldn't watch the shuffle. Besides, the game was cold and was being fiercely denounced by the press. For a time, he kept warm in a bowling alley. Drive a man into a corner and goad him to desperation, and he will go so far as to bowl, provided that he lives in a German neighborhood. One evening, he went down to see the Walhallas go against the Schwabens, but the place was dark. The authorities had interfered. It seemed that the manufacture of bowling balls involved the destruction of the hardwood forests while the game itself overtaxed certain important muscles, ending with Alice, at the same time encouraging profanity and the use of five-cent cigars. Steve had one standby left to him. He could prop himself up on them. Bleachers with a bag of lubricated popcorn between his knees and hurl insulting remarks at Honest Wagner, Joe Tinker, and Ty Cobb. When he crawled up in the 50-cent seats, he found the same old bunch that used to answer roll call at the pool room the Sharky Club, and the betting ring. The law had made them decent citizens, but it hadn't made them any easier to look at. Steve longed for the ponies and the good old prelims between the trial horses, with blood dripping from the ropes, but when he picked up the pink sporting page in the morning, all he could find was that the Sacred Heart Academy has wrested the basketball trophy away from the West Division High. School. Baseball is only mere sport to one who has wanged the wise ikes that mark up the odds. Steve went to it because there was nothing else on the cards. One day he found every entrance to the park guarded by a blue burly and the crowds being turned away. The health department had put in a knock on the game on the ground that the ball, after being handled by various players and passed from one to the other, carried with it dangerous microbes. The officials insisted that, after every play, the ball should be treated with an antiseptic or else that each player should have an individual ball and allow no one else to touch it. The Society for the Protection of the Young had put up a howl because the game diverted the attention of urchins from their work in the public schools and tended to encourage mendacity among office boys. The concatenated order of highbrows had represented to the proper authorities that, as a result of widespread interest in the demoralizing pastime, ordinary conversation on the tail end of a trolley car was becoming unintelligible to university graduates, and the reports in the daily press had passed beyond the ken of a mere student of the English language. The Medical Society certified that eight out of ten men had shattered their nervous systems, split their vocal cords, and developed moral astigmatism, all because of the paroxysms resulting from partisan fervor. Either build an asylum in every block or else liberate the present inmates of all the nut colleges. It was not fair to keep the quiet ones locked up while the raving bugs were admitted to the grandstand every afternoon. Under the circumstances, a purely paternal administration could do only one thing. It put baseball out of business. On the very next afternoon, the unquenchable demand for sport asserted itself. Steve went into the backyard with his eldest son and looked about. Cautiously, is the lookout stationed on the fence? He asked. He is. Is the garden gate securely locked? It is. Are the mallets properly muffled? They are. Then tell with the law. We'll have a game of croquet. Morale. If it is in the blood, the only remedy is the substitution of iced tea. The Collision by George Aid. Once in the dim, dead days beyond recall, there lived a blue eyed gazook named Steve. We refer to the period preceding the uplift when the candidate wearing the largest collar was the people's choice for aldermen. A good citizen wishing to open a murder parlor needed a couple of black bottles, a barrel of sawdust, and a pull at the city hall. When he opened up, he threw the key into the river and arranged to have the bodies taken out through the alley so as not to impede traffic in the main thoroughfares, Twelve months every year marked the open season for every game from pitch and toss to manslaughter. Anyone in search of diversion could roll Kelly Pool at 10 cents a cue in the morning, go to the track in the afternoon, take in a 20-round scrap in the evening, 
and then shoot at the wheel a few times before backing into the flax. The police were instructed to make sure that all pushcart peddlers were properly licensed. Steve roamed the wide open town and spread his bets both ways from the jack. When he cut the string and began to back his judgment, he knew no limit except the Milky Way. Any time he rolled them, you could hear considerable rumble. All the bookies, barkeeps, bruisers, and the boys sitting on the moonlight rattlers knew him by his first name and had him tagged as a producer and a hell of a nice fellow. Steve heard vague rumors that certain stiffs who hurried home before midnight and wore white mufflers were trying to put the town on the fritz and can all the live ones. But he did not dream that a mug who went around in galoshes and drank root beer could put anything across with the main swive over at the hall. Oh, the rude awakening. One day he was in a pool room working on the form sheet with about 150 other students and getting ready to back Sazerac off the boards in the third at Guttenberg when some blue wagons backed up and Steve told the desk sergeant a few minutes later that his name was Andrew Jackson. Next day, he had a wire from a trainer, but when he went to the old, familiar joint, the plainclothes men gave him the sign to beat it, and he turned away, throbbing with indignation. The downtown books were being raided, but the Angoras kept on, galloping at the track so he rode out on the train every day in order to preserve his rights as a freeborn American. One day, just as he was peeling from his role in front of the Kentucky Club in order to grab Gertie Glue at 8 to 5, Lightning struck the paddock and laid out the entire works. When the touts and the sheet writers and the sure thingers came to and began to ask questions, it was discovered that the Yap legislature had killed the racing game and ordered all the regulars to go to work. Steve went back to town in a dazed condition to hunt up the gang and find out what could be done to put out the fire. When he arrived at the hangout, there was a flag at half mast. The Roost had been nailed up for keeping open after 11 o'clock. A few evenings after that, he sauntered up to a large frame building to look at a couple of boys who had promised to make 135 ringside. A cannon was planted at the main chute, and the street was filled with department store employees disguised as soldiers. Nothing doing. The governor had called out the militia in order to prevent a blot being put upon the fair name of the Commonwealth. With the selling platers turned out to pasture, the brace box, and the pinch wheel lying in the basement at Central Station, the pugs going back to the foundry and all the street lamps being taken in at midnight, no wonder Steve was hard pushed to find innocent amusement. He started to hang around a broker's office, but it was no fun to bet on a turn up when you couldn't watch the shuffle. Besides, the game was cold and was being fiercely denounced by the press. For a time, he kept warm in a bowling alley. Drive a man into a corner and goad him to desperation, and he will go so far as to bowl, provided that he lives in a German neighborhood. One evening, he went down to see the Walhallas go against the Schwabens, but the place was dark. The authorities had interfered. It seemed that the manufacture of bowling balls involved the destruction of the hardwood forests, while the game itself overtaxed certain important muscles, ending with Alice, at the same time encouraging profanity and the use of five-cent cigars. Steve had one standby left to him. He could prop himself up on them. Bleachers with a bag of lubricated popcorn between his knees and hurl insulting remarks at Honest Wagner, Joe Tinker, and Ty Cobb. When he crawled up in the 50-cent seats, he found the same old bunch that used to answer roll call at the pool room, the sharky club, and the betting ring. The law had made them decent citizens, but it hadn't made them any easier to look at. Steve longed for the ponies and the good old prelims between the trial horses, with blood dripping from the ropes, but when he picked up the pink sporting page in the morning, all he could find was that the Sacred Heart Academy has wrested the basketball trophy away from the West Division High. School. Baseball is only mere sport to one who has wanged the wise ikes that mark up the odds. Steve went to it because there was nothing else on the cards. One day he found every entrance to the park guarded by a blue burly and the crowds being turned away. The health department had put in a knock on the game on the ground that the ball, after being handled by various players and passed from one to the other, carried with it dangerous microbes. The officials insisted that, after every play, the ball should be treated with an antiseptic or else that each player should have an individual ball and allow no one else to touch it. 
The Society for the Protection of the Young had put up a howl because the game diverted the attention of urchins from their work in the public schools and tended to encourage mendacity among office boys. The concatenated order of highbrows had represented to the proper authorities that, as a result of widespread interest in the demoralizing pastime, ordinary conversation on the tail end of a trolley car was becoming unintelligible to university graduates, and the reports in the daily press had passed beyond the ken of a mere student of the English language. The Medical Society certified that eight out of ten men had shattered their nervous systems, split their vocal cords, and developed moral astigmatism, all because of the paroxysms resulting from partisan fervor. Either build an asylum in every block or else liberate the present inmates of all the nut colleges. It was not fair to keep the quiet ones locked up while the raving bugs were admitted to the grandstand every afternoon. Under the circumstances, a purely paternal administration could do only one thing. It put baseball out of business. On the very next afternoon, the unquenchable demand for sport asserted itself. Steve went into the backyard with his eldest son and looked about. Cautiously, is the lookout stationed on the fence? he asked. He is. Is the garden gate securely locked? It is. Are the mallets properly muffled? They are. Then tell with the law, we'll have a game of croquet, morale. If it is in the blood, the only remedy is the substitution of iced tea. 